I'd like to introduce the moder moderator of our next panel session, Leveraging the Power of, Cla of Crowds. Richard Swart is research director at UC Berkeley, and he'll introduce his panelists. Welcome. Let's come up, guys. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for surviving. I realize the last panel session of the day can always be a bit of an intellectual challenge to stay alert. So we have four very different presentations this afternoon. I'm going to keep mine mercifully brief, being the professor in the room. I'm going to try to keep it very short um, and allow the panelists that are engaged in some very creative exercises in how to leverage crowdsourcing. And you'll, you're about to learn about the future of distributed work, the future of work, how to leverage innovative models of crowdsourcing inside organizations, and my, my research is inside and outside. So I'm going to start with uh, introducing the panelists. We have Matt Cooper from Elance Odesk. He has had a senior leadership role for many years, essentially responsible for product development and innovation. Uh, John Hoskins from Amazon Mechanical Turk, senior project manager. And Tomohiro Fujiwara-san, I hope I said that correctly, um, here from Fujitsu. I'm forgetting your exact title. I apologize for that. So, general manager of FSAS. So, it's been a long day for me as well. I started my day four o'clock in the morning in the airport, so please, please bear with me. So, with no further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and very briefly go through a few key concepts, and then I'm gonna turn it over to the, the panelists. So, if you'll start with mine. And I wish I was the director of research at the university. I'm actually the director of research of one program at the university. Some people might be mad if I claim that title. So, if you could open up my, my mind, please. Okay. Thank you. So, I love Twitter. Please go ahead and tweet if you're into Twitter. And uh, apologies to Stanford, but go Bears. So, I'm going to start with the big ideas in my presentation and then drill down. So, my research looks at the innovation of crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, and innovation and the process of funding innovation. Uh, Sarah from Indiegogo did a great job earlier talking about her model, but she's one of 2,700 crowdfunding platforms in the world. 1,600 of which launched in the last 12 months. There are also now crowdfunding initiatives being done by about 25 of the Fortune 100. And so a lot of my work has now shifted to corporate enterprise and organizational uses of crowdfunding mechanisms to drive innovation. We'll talk about that. So the first key difference is, how does the crowd empower change in your organization? How does the crowd empower innovation? So I'm gonna do a little thought experiment for you. If I were to ask all of you to Facebook like me or linked to me on LinkedIn, be a relatively low friction request. However, if I asked all of you to give me $20, I think the compliance may change. This is a fundamental simplistic observation, but that money changes human behavior, and financial commitment is the deepest form of commitment. And crowdfunding is the next stage of crowdsourcing, where we're looking at a contribution of funds, whether your funds or the research funds or the fund from the innovation director or funds that you syndicate with an investor, that commitment causes emotional engagement or emotional commitment in the project. There's a recent project here, Oculus uh, Virtual Reality Technology. Uh, they started on Kickstarter. They got bought by Facebook for $2 billion, and people were mad at them. And they were mad because they felt like they were part of a community, and they felt like they had been betrayed by selling out to a large organization. Normally, when there's a $2 billion exit in the Valley, we think of that as a positive outcome. But crowdfunding creates a deep emotional commitment. So a couple of interesting new ideas to think about. So how many of your organizations have invested a serious amount of money in social media and have absolutely no clue if you have an ROI on that investment? 99% of organizations in the world, the answer would be we don't know if there's an ROI. Crowdfunding mechanisms, when applied, become a way to monetize your investment into social media. They're a way of pulling value back out of your network of relationships. So crowdfunding can be all these things, market product validation, customer validation, research and development, driving innovation, finding evangelists, and it's a great way of finding great young employees. Some major corporations using crowdfunding, I won't bore you with all their stories but it's becoming very prominent. <clears throat> so let's talk about a use case example. So what if I were to say that by giving money to a team in your organization, 
and that having those team members vote with actual dollars as opposed to tallying, voting, any other mechanism that does not involve the distribution of actual cash, you can actually create cross-departmental collaboration in distributed organizations. You can have your team in Bangalore, your team in Japan, your team in Santa Monica break down racial, gender, school, and language barriers and actually form emotionally committed relationships with other researchers and other innovators through the use of crowdfunding internally. IBM's been doing this very successfully in some pilot projects. They're about to publish some papers in the area. They've done four iterations of this project. The research team had to keep going back to the data because they did not believe their own data. The outcomes were so positive, they could not believe their own data. It's a rare problem to have such extraordinarily positive outcomes you don't trust your own research. So the other thing that you can do is use crowdfunding competitions, XPRIZE models to identify potential acquisition targets, but you not only find innovative technologies, you push the boundary one step further and you're now finding companies that can actually execute, can actually communicate with customers, that actually have a product that people care about, and you can actually see how the team behaves. So it takes the acquisition decision making away from just the technology into the behavior of the team themselves, which is a huge shift. Marketing, I won't spend much time talking about marketing, but major brands are doing it very quickly. Dodge took one of their worst performing cars to the crowdfunding campaign called the Dodge Dart Registry. Had 7,000 people create a crowdfunding campaign. Only 39 cars were actually bought, and the next quarter their product sales went up 4X and have maintained a 4X growth ever since. So if I told you I could take a $100 million product line, spend $100,000 on a marketing campaign and 4X your sales, you would probably think I'm insane. But Dodge has done it. So we've talked about marketing and innovation. There's also corporate social responsibility. Not the topic of this, of this conference, but an interesting topic nonetheless. The pain point in most CSR initiatives is Local impact, local press, you can't get national reach. Through using crowdfunding mechanisms and crowdfunding competitions, you can take your corporate social responsibility initiatives to a national or international audience with essentially zero incremental spend. Secondly, your young employees prefer to be engaged in making a difference. The fact that the corporation writes a check to a school or to a charity does not motivate the employees. If you can challenge them, and say, let's see how much of an impact we as a team or division can create in our communities. Here's a pool of money, leverage that money by creating crowdfunding around making impact in our community. You sometimes have 10 or 20 X returns on the corporate CSR investment that you put in as a corporation. So rather than having a committee that allocates funds, you challenge your employees to make the largest impact and you use crowdfunding to do that. So I'm giving you a very broad overview and Blade and Plug, we're teaching the first class at Berkeley this fall on enterprise use of crowdfunding. Lee Fleming just joined us from Harvard Business School, one of the world's top experts on diffusion of innovation, and he's the one who disambiguated the US patent database for the patent people in the audience. We actually have the best patent database in the universe, says Google. So we study a lot of the effects of policy on innovation, and Lee's gonna co-teach the class with me. Uh, Sarah had some slides about crowdfunding is equally distributed. Here's the number of projects launched in crowdfunding. I'm a professor, I have to have one data slide, right? So by population size and cities, here's crowdfunding, here's success. Launch, success. Look at the East Coast, look at the West Coast. What we're finding is that the rhetoric of crowdfunding is that it democratizes access to capital and access to innovation. What we're actually finding is it reinforces existing industry clusters. So areas that have video gaming, software technology, wearable fitness technology, whatever it, whatever it is, if you're in that center of activity, you're likely to get funded, which explains California. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our distinguished panelists, and I'm gonna let uh, John, I believe you're next up. Thank you. So as Richard mentioned, I am part of AWS, which is our cloud computing division of Amazon. And I'm going to talk about the other end of the spectrum and in leveraging crowds. And that is applying cloud labor to human intensive workflows and how that's transforming business processes. And to start, 
I'm going to lay some groundwork. Um, cloud is often a misused term. It's a very popular term these days, and in fact, I would almost guarantee that you could dust off any old product you had, stick cloud on it, and you'd sell a bunch. The reality is, often people think cloud is an access model. They think about, okay, I can put my pictures in the cloud, I can put my videos in the cloud, and therefore I can access them from anywhere with any device. Well, really, the internet was the enabling technology that allowed that. The reality is, cloud is a consumption model. So when creating cloud computing, you're thinking about the ability now to consume resources as much as you need, when you need it, and you only pay for what you use. So you've heard a lot of folks talk around this subject today, but this is the fact. This is the enabling technology behind cloud that allows you to scale quickly from a very small amount of money, from a very small investment to whatever you might need at whatever point. So then, I'm going to give you my definition, at least, of crowdsourcing, because again, another often misused term. Um, Wiki says that a large group of people is considered a mob. But when you apply a common interest, they become a, a crowd. So it's my belief that if you can harness that common interest out of a large group of individuals, you can move it in a direction of productivity. And that's what crowdsourcing is. So now when we put the two together, we start to think about cl cloud labor. So if I can create flexible, on-demand, pay-as-you-go humans with a common interest of earning money, I can create a labor force that I can apply to problems. So what are the challenges? Well, first of all, finding that large, scalable workforce. How are you going to pull together enough people to create what appears to be infinite demand of human cognitive capability? At the same time, keep the flywheel spinning. The idea behind critical mass is the fact that whenever workers come to the environment to do this work, um, there has to be work for them to do. On the flip side, whenever somebody puts a request into the system to get work done, somebody has to be there to do it. If there's not any work for me to do, eventually I'll go away. If my work doesn't get done, eventually I'll find another solution. So these are two of the critical components to finding a way to create this infinitely scalable on-demand workforce. And then the key about paying for only what you use means you have to change the, the human cost paradigm. You have to change it to a per piece price process. So in other words, I'm only going to pay humans when they're giving me answers. When they're not, I won't. Now, in order to apply this in a cloud environment, I have to make programmatic access. In our EC2 or S3 services, you just flip up on the internet, you sign in, and boom, you can spin up as much storage or as much compute power as you want. We had to, you have to apply the same concepts and techniques to the crowd. You have to give people the ability to programmatically talk to these humans um, in, a, in a, uh, a reasonably controlled way. And I'll tell you why a little later in the presentation. And part of that, because they are humans, is you have to automate the quality controls and the workflow building blocks. Humans make mistakes. Computers don't. So the idea is that these APIs have to give you the ability in real time with technology in an automated fashion to determine whether or not you have a usable answer out of your human helper. So those are the characteristics. So I'll stop and tell you a little bit about Mechanical Turk. People often ask, well, why is Amazon in this business? Well, fundamentally, we needed this kind of thing to solve a problem we had internally. But what we ultimately decided was once we had solved that, we thought, well, this is something people could use. But what role do we want to play? Well, the role we wanted to play was to create a marketplace. That's something that we're kind of good at. So the idea behind the marketplace is this is a marketplace for work. It's currently, as of April 19th, 2012, we don't update metrics very frequently, but it, we're 500,000 workers in 190 countries, probably twice that by now. And I want to talk a little bit about who these workers are because the first thing that comes to mind is it's often underprivileged, underemployed, third world individuals. Well, it's not. These people have broadband access. They're computer literate. Mechanical Turk is a computer UI. Um, more than half of them are in the United States. Almost half of them are college educated. Where the capacity comes for this environment and where we think you'll gain the capacity to be able to create cloud labor is through that excess cognitive capacity. I think it's somewhere around, I read a statistic and I apologize for not having it specifically, but it's somewhere around 9 billion human hours are spent a month on Facebook. 3.6 billion hours a month are spent watching YouTube videos. 
Now, if you could harness that excess time, you could build somewhere around five Empire State buildings every single day of the year for the rest of eternity. So that's where the cognitive capacity is coming for this work. Now the challenge is, where do you apply it and how do you apply it? So I've kind of broken down um, five areas where we see crowds being applied today to productivity. Um, the first is ideation base. This is the whole concept of maybe harnessing some of the social media, um, testing out concepts, new products, getting feedback, customer service. Um, expertise base might be where you go to a website to ask a legal question. You're not really sure who's going to answer the question, but you have confidence in the fact that there's expertise there and that they will come back to you with a, with a legitimate answer. An extension of that is more freelance, where the worker actually comes and plugs into a process and fills gaps in skill sets, and software services in a, in a similar manner. These three in the middle, we really consider more of a manual process, and the reason we apply that is because in those processes, there's often collaboration, communication between worker and requester of work, and that process is different than what we focus on. We're focused on the concept of microtasking. We believe that if you can disintegrate your workflow down to an, a series of binary tasks where there's a very clear right and wrong answer, you can fully automate human intensive workflows. And you can also maximize the efficiency of your human cognitive capacity. Then when you apply a crowd to that, you can create a fully automated human process. So how do you automate? Well, first, we're seeing a view now where workers are going to begin to support, support technology. In the past, it's always been technology has been around to support the humans of these workflows. Well, in reality, we're starting to see that reverse. We're starting to see humans sitting behind the technology and correcting it as it goes. And to get there, we tell you, focus on the work, not the worker. So the real challenge here is, can I take my workflow and disintegrate it down and create an environment in which any individual in this room could take the question I need an answered and answer it accurately. So and again, automation is the key. The final step is the quality control has to be automated. In other words, I have to turn responses from random humans that are unidentified into answers, which is what my process needs. And to do that and to follow through with the technology, the workforce has to be flexible. I think it was Gartner coined this as BPAS business process as a service, where the technology will now be facing the customers and the humans will be sitting behind the technology. So what does this mean? Well, it's a whole new process paradigm. You'll go now from the way these processes were done in the past is batching up work, sending it out to pools of humans who would execute against it, send it back, the technology would execute on it. An example people have given is onboarding a new employee. You're going to have somebody sit at 13 disparate systems and key in the same information across all 13 in order to onboard them. Well, the reality is the new process paradigm is the technology is going to drive this process. And when it has an exception, it's going to reach out to a human. It's going to reach out to them through an API. And the human's going to respond back through the API. The API will help adjudicate that answer and let the technology go on its way. So that creates a new outsourcing consumption pattern, the requirement for cloud labor. The idea is now humans are on standby. In order to create an environment which your humans are going to enjoy being on standby, you need that critical mass. Um, the other thing that this does, and this is a, an outcropping or a, an artifact of the whole disintegration process, is that you can actually begin to optimize and innovate through your process and eliminate virtually all error. In fact, you know, one of the hallway sayings at Amazon, and it comes straight from Jeff, is we will continue to iterate and optimize until we are statistically insignificant from perfect. And what this process does is it allows you to do that because now instead of maybe having a judgment on an entire form in a forms processing example, you'll actually have a confidence factor of every single character of every single field of the form. And with that, you'll be able to do a, ma a mathematical calculation of your confidence of the entire form being correct which means you'll be able to find the outliers and solve for the outlier problems. And then finally, what we're seeing, and I'll give a couple, three examples here at the end, is we're seeing transformational delivery metrics. We're seeing workflow processes that used to have these batch stages in them flipping to real time. And in real time, it changes the way you do business. It changes the way you service your customers. It changes the way you do things. So 
Here are a couple examples. Um, Comscore, if you're familiar with them, they catalog web activity, and one of the things that they do is they scrape every single ad creative that they find on the internet and have to categorize it so they can determine how many eyeballs saw it. What they discovered was they used a, a standard BPO to be categorizing all this data. They have heuristics that does about 80% of it, and then the last 20% go through humans. And when they built a process similar to what I described, what they found out was not necessarily 20% error coming through, but that 20% of the things they were grabbing weren't really ads. And that was affecting their metrics. And the only way they found that out was to find those outliers, and those were the outliers. So they were actually able to improve their process by 20%. Another example of Fortune 50 consumer products good company basically works on um, the ability to uh, look at uh, planograms. If you think about a planogram, it's product mix and, and quantities on a shelf. And they know statistically and through big data what mixes work the best. And so they send reps into the field to photograph shelves. It was a nine-day human intensive process to count and position everything off the shelf. Then the heuristics would take over, spit out a new sales plan. The sales plan would go back to the rep. The rep would go back to the store and then implement the new plan, often 30 to 45 days later. By building a process similar to this, they were getting answers back in 20 minutes while the rep was still in the store. And the idea there is they have 45 days of sales time that they've just bought. And that was infinitely valuable to them. And then the final example, this is the one that gets me the most excited and then I'll quit. But OpenFDA is actually a new initiative that I think is launching this month. And the FDA, every time you have a drug interaction, you take a prescription from your doctor and maybe you're taking something else and it creates a reaction, you fill out a form and it goes to the FDA and they record all that. And they have a huge database of this information. And the problem they have is that database is somewhere between 30 and 90 days out of date because that's how long it takes them through their process to get this stuff in. Well, in June, they're actually opening an API to developers to access that database so that products can be created that give you real-time drug interaction information and real-time uh, product food ingredient information. The problem is it has to be current. So they built a process where, again, using human cloud-based labor, they're now able to process these forms in minutes instead of months, and the database is up to date so that when you go into the store and you scan that gluten-free package, it will tell you truly whether it's gluten-free or not. So I hope that spurs some ideas of thoughts, and um, from that, I think I turn it over to Matt. Great. Thank you. So uh, you... You saved me some time in explaining what we do. So the, okay. the box on the right that showed microtasks, we do everything to the left of that box. So uh, Elance and Odesk, uh, we are a marketplace for freelancers. So we provide uh, companies access to a global talent pool um, and freelance workforce in a much more flexible and scalable way than the, than the traditional recruiting and HR model. Um, so when you think about the traditional employment model and, and that whole construct, it was designed for a very different time. So the current regulatory environment, the current structure, the legal structure of how we manage our working relationships with employees was really created in the industrial age. People were starting to come into work in cities, they were working in big factories, the corporation was on the rise. We needed a new set of structure to manage those working relationships, and in many cases to protect the worker. Um, when we think about the world today with the internet and agile and cloud and crowd and um, the traditional model of engaging with a worker as an employee doesn't quite fit the way companies think about building their business. Um, when you do it, there are countless surveys of CEOs and executives, what is holding back the business? Every single one of them will say it's talent, it's people. I can't find the people I need in the places I need them, when I need them, with the right skills, education, experience, et cetera. Um, and again, this is where we have a mismatch. Um, particularly in the Valley, you don't walk into an interview these days and say, how long do I have to work here until I get my pension, right? I mean, if, you, if you've been in a company for more than three years, you're a grizzled veteran, right? So companies are looking for a much more flexible way to engage talent. Workers are also looking for a much more flexible way. They don't want to come into the office anymore. 
And if you look at all the surveys of the millennial generation, they just have a very, very different expectation of what their work-life balance is going to be. I mean, my first job was at J.P. Morgan as an investment banking associate. I was beaten relentlessly for 80 hours a week for four years, and I loved it. That is not what our current grads are looking for. Uh, they want to be managers. They want to run their own show. They want to choose the work that they're going to work on, when they want to work on it, from where they are going to work on it. Um, they just don't think of the cubicle farm as their future. And we're starting to see this shift um, across all demographics. So in 2005, about 7% of the U.S. workforce was freelance independent. Today it's about a third, and by 2020 it will be half. So by 2020, more than half of the workforce is not going to want to come sit down in your office and be an employee. They're not going to want to be employed by anybody. Back in 2007, you ended up as a freelancer or an independent contractor. You didn't choose that. Today, more and more people are choosing to be independent contractors and choosing to be freelancers because we're all on 24-7. I mean, we're all working. We all have our phones. They're going off at soccer practice. You're working on the weekends. You're working nights. If you want to get up and go run an errand during the middle of the day, you don't feel, you don't feel awkward about it anymore. My first job as an intern, I never left the office because I was scared to death somebody would think I wasn't working hard. Now, if I need to go run an errand during the day, hey, you want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with me on hours worked? Fine. I'll show you every hour I work. Uh, so again, this, this shift towards control and wanting more um, uh, management of your life is pushing people in this direction. The need for a more flexible workforce is pushing businesses this direction. For all the same reasons that you're using AWS and you don't have a server sitting in your closet in the office, it's the same reason people are hiring freelancers more frequently. So when we look, think about this evolution, you know, classified ads to job boards to LinkedIn to the online workplace. So what we've built, and I'll show you some of this in a minute, is really take LinkedIn and add all of your annual um, uh, manager reviews and make that public. So we now have a very public, very high transparency, high accountability marketplace for freelancers. So everybody knows who's good and who's not. It's abundantly clear. And so as the workforce is involved, and, and you know, again, back to this evolution of the workforce to freelance and companies to a more agile way of working, you need to be able to assess who's good and who's not for your particular skill at your particular time in a much more efficient way. Um, and when you add in the fact that this is a globally distributed model, uh, you know, this is something we believe firmly in, that talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. When I, you know, I look at how Odesk and Elance have built their business. So we have 250 full-time employees, most of which are here in the Bay Area. We have close to 500 freelancers that work for us across the world. I think we're in probably 50 different countries. Um, probably about 150 of those are engineers. So for any of you who have tried to hire an engineer lately in the Bay Area, you can imagine the cost and the time it would take for us to hire 150 engineers in the Bay Area. We just couldn't do it. We, our business wouldn't grow the way it has grown if we didn't have access to this global talent pool. So by moving everything into this online marketplace, we can now shift the balance of supply and demand for certain talent and skills on a global basis. So I always talk a lot about eBay. So eBay, if you were a Beanie Baby collector in Detroit prior to the existence of eBay, there's probably not a liquid market for Beanie Babies in Detroit. There's not enough buying and selling going on. But when you aggregate that supply and demand on a global basis using the internet, now all of a sudden you have a liquid market. So what we've done is we now have about 2 million companies and about 8 million freelancers on our combined platforms. So we merged. Odesk and Elance is like merging the Red Sox and the Yankees. But uh, we, uh, it's gone very well. We're all very happy. It, uh, we're all playing well in the sandbox. Uh, but uh, we, we combined our two platforms. Uh, to create the powerhouse in this space. So now we have, uh, last year, 2013, combined, we did about $750 million through the platform, uh, and we see you know, rapid expansion in our future. Um, there's a couple things we've built to drive this model and to make this distributed working relationship more transparent. So on the, on the top right here, you'll see uh, a series of thumbnails. One of the key parts of our software, let's say I hire you to build me a website or to write a blog for me. If I'm paying you by the hour, anytime you're billable to me, our software takes a screenshot of what you're working on at random intervals about five, six times an hour. So for me as the client, 
with a worker who's sitting on the other side of the world or on the other side of the country, I now have complete transparency to where my money's going. I know that you're working on my stuff. For the freelancer, as long as you track your time using our software, we guarantee that you'll be paid. So if the client in San Francisco flakes on the invoice, you get paid every week regardless, doesn't matter. If you did the work and you tracked your time, we make sure you get paid, we'll go track down the invoice. So by inserting ourselves in the middle and, and using this platform as the core, we can make a relationship that would otherwise be a little uncertain much more trustworthy, much more uh, transparent, and it's fair for everyone. And, and then by building up these profiles over time, you can see, you know, you can, uh, unfortunately this isn't a great view, but for every freelancer on our platform, we have the number of hours they've worked, the number of projects they've worked, which projects they've worked on, what rates they were working at, uh, skills tests, certifications. If you are .NET certified, it's on your profile. So now as you, when you go in and you need a .NET developer, you can go to the Microsoft certified .NET group and pick one. And you know who's good. The people with four and a half stars and up keep getting more jobs. The people with two stars get pushed out of the marketplace. So the cream rises to the top and you end up with a workforce that is built around deliverables. They, are, they have been um, groomed to focus on giving you exactly what you need when you need it. Because if they don't, your two star review is going to go on their profile and they're going to have a lot of explaining to do to get their next job. So it's everybody's aligned and everybody's pushing in the same direction. Uh, as a result, we've seen tremendous growth. And I think one of the, the key points here is we started out almost entirely in mobile uh, and web development. So you can see back in 2008, 2009, almost all of our work and all the hours worked and dollars earned was in IT. Um, through no sort of deliberate effort of our own, we saw this explosion in non-technical work in 2009. And so today, you can find, you name it, if it can be done in front of a computer, somebody's doing it on our platform. And so you have this interesting dynamic where you have the, the most common skill sets, PHP, Java, iOS, Android, uh, and we can see a very liquid market. You see which countries are buying which skills at what rates. You know, you could, we have a global, um, a global view into how skills are transferring across borders. But we also now have this long tail. So again, back to the Beanie Baby example, there are some very obscure technologies and skills that once you aggregate supply and demand on a global basis, now you have a liquid market. We, one of my favorite anecdotes is we have an astronomer. I always come this close to saying astrologer, and that's a very different job. Uh, we have an astronomer in Germany who takes pictures of the universe, and they have a very customized, high-end graphics package that they use to uh, post-process these pictures. In rural Germany, there's not a lot of these people running around with this skill and with this software package. He's using our platform to find people in three or four different countries all over the world to do this processing for him. He drops it into a file sharing program. They do their post-processing. They drop it back in, and it's done. So it's a great example of one of these long-tail skills that he'd sort of be out of luck if he had to do it locally. Um, now, we've seen a dramatic shift towards the enterprise over the last couple of years, uh, in the last 12 months in particular. Um, you know, again, we have 2 million clients, so you can imagine that 2 million clients, uh, if they were all spending enterprise money, I'd be, uh, I'd be wearing a nicer suit. Um, but we've seen this push into the enterprise over the last couple of years. The, the smaller companies came to us because they didn't have access to the talent they needed. They couldn't compete locally. Now we're having larger companies come to us because they either can't find the content, or the, excuse me, the, uh, the talent they need locally, or they couldn't retain it, or they only needed it for a short period of time. So they're coming to us for a much more flexible model. And so uh, I guess last year, mid-year last year, we launched this private talent cloud model. So what we were hearing from our enterprise customers is, hey, I love the marketplace concept. I want marketplace dynamics to drive costs down and to drive efficiency, but I don't want the whole world to know what's going on in my, in my cloud. So we created this private talent cloud where Fujitsu could now create a Fujitsu certified talent cloud. They sign your NDA, they sign your proprietary inventions agreement. We run them through whatever background screening checks you need. You define what the criteria is for someone to get into your cloud and be available to your workforce. Um, and we push them through and we enforce that along the way. So now you have a customized cloud of talent. We can create a marketing cloud, we can create a development cloud, engineering, a um, data entry, you name it, whatever talent you want, we can create that cloud for you and it's private, lockdown, secure, specifically for you. 
So we've developed this model and, and we've seen a lot of interest in this. Um, and this is just a, a quick snapshot of some of the companies using us today and they're really making a push into this freelance model. And the use cases range. I mean, we've got companies doing large BPO type programs with 1,500 freelancers doing data structuring to optimize their algorithm. Uh, we have high-end translation and localization. We have a lot of blog and article writing. So you need high-end content written to drive SEO results. You want product descriptions or buying guides. Um, so there really is a pretty wide range of uses. Um, AOL has been an interesting use case. One of, their, uh, you know, one of their divisions in Virginia, the CTO, has given all of their engineers free reign to hire up to three developers to back them up. So he calls it the brain extension. And so they're using it in two ways. One is when I go home at night, I package it up and I hand it to my shadow on the other side of the world and he moves the ball forward, I come back in the morning and progress has been made. So I got to go home and hang out with my kids and have a nice dinner, but somebody was working on my behalf. And it gives me as an engineer an opportunity to manage and, and coach a small team. Uh, the other is just skills they don't have in-house. So they need a specific skill for a short period of time. They can now tap into it and, uh, and get the projects done faster. So it's, So some of the programs look more like big BPO programs. Others are much more distributed where each hiring manager, each frontline engineer can build their own small team to get their job done. Um, when we think about the, the market and, and what's possible, <coughs> excuse me, the, you know, the $422 billion staffing market is where most people go today. And back to the issue of why people are moving our direction, that traditional staffing model just isn't giving them access. In the Bay Area, you've got every staffing firm picking over the same people. There's no, there's no new talent pool that they're bringing. Uh, but ultimately, we think the opportunity for us is this $2 trillion contingent labor model. And that's outsourcing its agencies, its BPOs, its staffing firms, any kind of short-term contingent labor that could be done by computer, that's something that we think we can handle. And again, when you think about uh, e-commerce as a great example, as big as e-commerce is, it's still only 6 to 8% of global retail sales. So we're not going to replace traditional employment anytime soon. But back to that $2 trillion market, just a very small shift in adoption in our, our direction is going to create a pretty massive business for us. So thank you for your time. Hopefully I've given you a couple things to think about and happy to answer questions here shortly. Yeah, which works on. Thank you, Rob. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to talk about uh, how we'll exploit uh, the crowdsourcing uh, with some case studies. At first, uh, let me introduce uh, one of the topics, uh, the crowdsourcing in Japan. Recently, the crowdsourcing uh, is getting an uh, attention in Japan. This May, uh, the Association of the Crowdsourcing uh, uh, has been established in Japan to contribute uh, gaining momentum uh, and uh, sound development. Uh, the members of the association will cooperate with each other uh, to uh, revitalize uh, the entire crowdsourcing industry uh, and uh, uh, revitalize uh, the uh, entire crowdsourcing uh, industry. And uh, our Fujitsu EFSAS uh, is also joining uh, this uh, association. Uh, I'd like to uh, utilize the crowdsourcing more and more uh, to uh, provide the solutions. Uh, provide the solutions. Next is uh, there are some uh, issues uh, to utilize uh, crowdsourcing uh, in Japan. Uh, this table shows it. Uh, one of the underlying concerns is uh, the characteristics of Japanese organization. As for uh, uh, specific and important work, manager uh, define a content of the work and need skill precisely. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as for uh, uh, common work, uh, like administrative work, they tend uh, not to define it. 
but uh, consider uh, workload and personality uh, of the uh, member. Uh, I think uh, uh, it is uh, Japanese culture is so high context. Uh, these are realized in uh, Japanese enterprises. In Japanese enterprises, uh, employees are required to cooperate with uh, colleagues uh, to build a uh, good teamwork and uh, flexibility. A person uh, who cope with, uh, cope with uh, uh, small work uh, is uh, very popular uh, in uh, Japanese companies. Uh, so, uh, as a result, uh, it is difficult to uh, delegate a part of business uh, to collaborators outside. Uh, in order to solve the issue, uh, we can utilize uh, Fujitsu's advantages. Uh, Fujitsu has a lot of uh, experiences uh, of system integration and service business. In system integration business, uh, we uh, understand a customer's uh, requirement and develop a system uh, on behalf of the customers. Uh, furthermore, uh, there are more than uh, 160 employees in Fujitsu Group. It can be supposed that uh, the employees are part of crowd. Uh, and uh, we are currently uh, uh, carrying out uh, various pilot on, the, on crowdsourcing within Fujitsu groups. Uh, by the way, uh, Fujitsu EFSAS has uh, established uh, this future center. We held a uh, face-to-face uh, face -to -face idea uh, generation meeting to discuss the experiments uh, of uh, in-house crowdsourcing. Uh, these are case studies. Uh, case one is to uh, collective uh, idea, uh, knowledge, and uh, wisdom. Case two is to uh, execute uh, indirect job by unexperienced employment. A case three is two outsource uh, data cleansing tasks in big data business uh, to uh, public cloud sourcing providers. Uh, by combining Japanese uh, original method and uh, Fujitsu's advantages, uh, we are uh, contribute uh, to utilizing crowd sourcing uh, in Fujitsu. Uh, this concept uh, called WA. Uh, these are three uh, characters in Japanese kanji. Uh, first one, first WA uh, means uh, connection or relations. Second WA uh, means conversation or dialogue. Uh, last, one, uh, last one is cooperation and harmony or uh, unity. Uh, this is uh, our uh, crowd sourcing utilization concept. Uh, we, are, uh, uh, we should, uh, uh, we, are, uh, we have uh, two resources, uh, crowd and crowd. Uh, our concept is uh, follows. Uh, uh, first, uh, we uh, uh, strengthen uh, cloud com computing technology and uh, uh, cloud sourcing technology. Uh, we can uh, utilize both uh, cloud and uh, cloud technology. Uh, our Fujitsu uh, is uh, uh, utilize uh, cloud sourcing uh, more and more. Uh, to, uh, uh, to the uh, human-centric uh, in intelligent society. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, I guess what I talk about is I'm still stuck by your comment that 50% of the workforce is going to be independent. That to me sounds like a tectonic shift in the nature of the workforce. Yeah. Um, I know that from my own research that the net of all job creation of the Fortune, of the Fortune 500 in the last 50 years is a net loss of jobs in the United States. Uh, all job creation is essentially a function of SMEs and small business and entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. So how does that trend that you're discussing forebode for economic growth? I mean, what, mm -hmm. I mean is it a function of the, of the companies not having the resources to scale or is it actually more efficient for the companies or what's going on? Yeah, so I, I think there's two pieces, or uh, I'll respond in two ways. One is the, when you think about a, an independent contractor or freelancer, you know, there is no business smaller than an independent contractor, right? right. You are the CEO, the CFO, the janitor, um, you do it all. And you know, I think so, when we look at the workforce that is migrating this way, they do tend to be more entrepreneurial, they tend to be more well-rounded, they're comfortable doing the business development that it takes to be a freelancer and get your next job, uh, as well as executing on whatever their core skill set is. Um, so I think a lot of the people that are moving this way tend to be more entrepreneurial in nature. Supporting them and making that easier, I think, is, a good, is good for everyone. And we've seen a lot of individual freelancers who are, find success on our marketplace. Eventually, they get so much work that they can't take it all, and they start to bring in their friends. And so it goes from a one-person con consultant to a small firm to a small company, and we have multiple examples of you know, one guy sitting on his couch doing web development. Next thing you know, he's built a web development agency because he was so good with his customers that he brought in more developers. So it's a nice um, sort of birthing place for small businesses. Um, the, other, the other interesting dynamic is the impact that this model has on small companies that are trying to grow in different ways. Um, when you know that you can turn on talent and turn it off should things not go well, you can take more risk, you can make bigger bets, you can try new services. Um, we had a great quote from a, a small company in Australia in Darwin, um, and he said, I have three local employees because I have six employees on Odesk. And we hear that a lot where they were able to start up their first business or they got, and it might be, I built my first mobile app for a fifth of what it would have cost me to hire a traditional agency or you know, I got my logo designed or I hired my first customer service rep. There, there's a lot of enablement that comes from being able to access talent in a much more efficient and flexible way. Okay. Phenomenal. So what about the, the, the flow of innovation? I mean, one of the challenges that I see is everyone's distributed, everyone's not communicating. How does this distributed workforce feed innovation back into the company's hiring? Them. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, maybe John could also address that. Yeah, I mean, you know, you get innovation through diversity, and when you've got people all over the world with very different approaches and very different thought processes and experiences and backgrounds, we have engineers in the Ukraine teaching us things in Redwood City that we would never have thought of. Um, so I think the you know, collaboration, again, this is also another demographic shift. We've got a whole group of people coming into the workforce that don't know life before the internet. And they don't think twice about building and maintaining relationships online, whether it's personal or professional. And whether it's Facebook or LinkedIn or Quora or whatever the hot new thing is, we're just much more comfortable sharing ideas, collaborating, um, socializing over the web with people that you're never going to see face to face. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> we're, we're really talking about approaching these problems from two different angles. You know, Matt's looking at um, headcount solving a definable problem that does require interaction. Um, we're looking at, again, coming from the work side. Think mm -hmm. more about the work where it doesn't really matter who does it. Collaboration is not required. And innovation comes out of the process. So if you think about the Kaizen, mm -hmm. the whole concept is as I begin to find my outliers, I will begin to innovate around those. So I think we're more focused on, on process. And mm -hmm. you know, as, as Elance and Odesk are focused more on, um, I don't want to minimize it, but the project base where it's you have a definable box of a series of skills that you can approach. And in that particular case, innovation comes in the form of new ideas, right? right? Yep. Directly from the workforce, whereas our workforce is providing us with the data to provide the new ideas. Okay. And Fujiwara, I was wondering if you could talk about, sorry, my eyes are bothering me here. Um, 
you're part of a huge global and innovative company. You talked about doing some potential case studies of how Fujitsu could use crowdsourcing. Have you actually had experiments or do you have ongoing projects that you can talk about? I realize you may not be able to talk about all of them, but is there anything you can share with us about what you're doing? Uh, uh, I, I think uh, uh, we are trying to uh, utilize crowdsourcing. Uh, there are many uh, issues uh, to uh, try uh, crowdsourcing uh, in, in Japan. Uh, utilizing uh, uh, the in-house crowdsourcing has uh, some impact uh, upon the internal uh, appraisal and accounting uh, system. Uh, the crowdsourcing has a, a factor uh, a, a disruptive uh, innovation. And uh, I think uh, it is one of the big challenges uh, how we can take it uh, flexibility. Flexibility. Um, to uh, to in innovate uh, uh, our uh, work style, uh, we ha we have to uh, more uh, communication uh, beyond the beyond the uh, organizational silos. Uh, uh, I try to uh, uh, this uh, broke the. Uh, the Broke the, this wall. Uh, this is uh, my uh, uh, first or uh, priority uh, job. Thank you. I know a lot of organizations are faced with essentially a uh, cash crunch, being blunt, so that uh, given the economic reality, crowdsourcing and crowdfunding is becoming the only economically viable way of funding. I mean, I'm not picking on Fujitsu here, I think you're in a different situation, but a lot of American companies specifically can't finance their own R&D to the level they used to be able to do so. So it's interesting seeing a shift in the perspective of allowing and encouraging outside R&D like the previous speaker talked about, or outside innovation and bringing that in-house, and then using, I, mean, I think the XPRIZE Foundation is a beautiful example of making huge changes in the American uh, technology base through these large prizes which galvanize the efforts of large organization, groups of people. Um, Let's turn it over to the audience. We only have about five minutes left. I want to make sure we leave some time for any other questions. Notable by its absence from your discussion was any discussion of development of employee skills. For instance, yeah. if you take the model that you've got and you integrate it forward as a differential equation in time, you conclude that, in, that one of your employees would be wise to develop great expertise in a piece of software and keep doing that as yeah. intensely as possible. But we all know that, for example, software systems on the scale of a few years, in fact, become obsolescent and right. then obsolete. And in fact, it is notable that your model does nothing to encourage employee development of additional skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, uh, I would disagree with that. Um, I think um, one of the advantages of an open marketplace model is it highlights where there's demand. So as a technology starts to ebb and another one starts to rise, you will see f the freelance you know, engineers will find adjacent skills, they'll latch onto the new technology, um, they will start to migrate where the demand is. So right now, there is more demand in our marketplace and globally for mobile development than there exists supply. Like there just isn't enough supply globally to meet the demand for mobile development. We are seeing more and more Java developers, you know, other backgrounds moving into mobile in an aggressive way because they see a lot of demand which drives up rates and that's all fully visible to the freelancer. So now, in many cases, you're right. Our clients are coming, they're looking for experts, not trainees, right? If I'm gonna hire you to build me a, map, a, a mobile app, this can't be your first rodeo. I wanna know that you've done this lots. So there's a balance there, um, but we do see individuals taking it on themselves to learn new skills and develop new talents. And with Udemy and Coursera and MIT and Stanford, yeah, the availability of online education, I can learn to code if I want. I just need the time and the energy. 
So for anybody who's motivated to do it, and we highlight where there's demand, the, the resources are out there, all it takes is their initiative to go pick up those skills and start earning in that category. I would just add to it that I think that works at all levels, right? I think is, you know, the key to, to our environment, and, and I think Matt's as well, is it, it is a marketplace. Yep. And uh, the workers are free to choose what they work on and when they work. And even in something as simple as forms processing on Mechanical Turk, workers will go invest the time to learn how to be transcribers yeah. or writers or, because they'll look at the marketplace and they'll say, wow, you know, the writers are making a lot more money than people moderating photos, for example. And, and they will acquire those skills and the, other, the acquiring side of the marketplace can score out those skills. Yeah. Yeah, and then along the similar lines, and one of the questions we often get is around security, right? You know, freelance workforce, there are no guarantees. You know, you, if somebody decides to end your contract, you're out of work. You got to hustle and get the next one. And when we talk to the people who are working on platforms like ours, they don't come to us because they want security and dependability and consistency. They come to us because they want control over their work. They want opportunity. Freedom. They want freedom. Yeah. Uh, they're just coming at us for a very different reason. If you want a guaranteed 40 hours a week, you know, there are lots of government jobs out there. Um, but if you want control and access and freedom and opportunity, that's when you come to our platforms. Very good. Other questions? Yeah, over here. It's right there. Thank you. Um, I'm Olga Patel from Mattel, as in Barbie and Hot Wheels toy company. <laughs> um, I have a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is that we've been doing crowdsourcing initiatives ourselves. We have an internal crowdsourcing platform, and we don't have 160,000 people, but we do have 25,000 people. Um, and we get our internal questions answered by people who work for the company in different geographies. And that's very productive for us. Uh, we do external crowdsourcing where we look to the world to give us technologies that we don't have or expertise that we don't have. Um, the question that I have is, Probably for Matt, um, it's very great that your workforce has a transparency. So um, you get a rating uh, depending on how well you do the job. Mm. Um, what happens if you have a terrible client? I mean, we've all had terrible bosses, right? Right. Um, and then what happens if you get rated low on, on, on a skill that you didn't have, but you go and you develop it? Right. Yeah, so, uh, you know, this is... Um it's kind of a microcosm of the way things work anyway. If I do a poor job in my current role and I go to get my next job, that, that company is going to talk to my CEO. They're going to pick up the phone and talk to him. And so in some ways, we're replicating a model and making it more efficient that exists in the offline world. Um, now that said, um, we do see people who run into a bad client and they have a bad relationship and they get off to a bad start. And if it's one of 60 projects, it's not gonna, not gonna hurt you. You may have a little explanation, but it's not gonna end your career on our platform. If, you, if it's your first one, that's tough to dig out of. Uh, and what we see people do to make sure that they get off to a good start and they, get, they build their feedback um, uh, from the ground up early is they, they take small, discrete jobs that they know that they can crush. And so your first few jobs, that's not the time to experiment. It's not the time to, to say, hey, I think I might be able to do this. It's where you go to your power alley and you take the job that you absolutely know you can crush. So you get that first five-star rating, you get your second job, your second five-star rating, and then you've built up the history. And if I've got 30 people who say I'm great and one person who says I'm terrible, I can survive. Uh, but we, you know, we do get questions of, hey, I looked through your marketplace, I don't see anybody with less than four stars. Well, A, I'm not going to show you anybody with less than four stars because we control who you see. And B, anybody with less than four stars can't get a job and they go away. So the marketplace mechanisms really do drive quality for both the client and the, the freelancer. They, we also give the freelancers information on the clients so they can decide who they want to work with and who they don't. So it, the two-sided marketplace drives trans, tri, transparency for both, uh, both parties. We're almost out of time, so I'm going to end with a quick, two very fast uh, snippet stories, and then we're going to let the uh, keynote speaker come up. So two things. Uh, about a month ago, I was sitting in New York City in a private equity office with about $250 billion under management, and they asked me, Dr. Swart, how do we put a billion dollars into crowd finance this year? Second question, I got a call literally here at this event from a company I 
that I work with, and they said, uh, we just got a $10 million unsolicited acquisition offer from a, one of the BlackRock portfolio companies. Should we take the 10 million or should we crowdfund? I said take the 10 million, but uh, <laughs> <coughs> the fact that someone would think about whether it's more effective, efficient, and, and logical for them to scale their company using crowdfunding and crowdfinance mechanisms than have an early exit is an indication how the market's maturing. The fact that some of the largest investors in the world are wanting to deploy hundreds of millions and billions of dollars. We have to recognize as a culture of innovation that the ground is shifting underneath us and that innovation and change is now being driven by a generation that distrusts institutions. And they fundamentally want to control their destiny. So crowdfunding is not the solution for every problem, but I think it's gonna change the way that all of your companies find and finance your innovation. And with that, we're gonna wrap up. And thank you to the distinguished panelists. It's been fascinating. Thank you.